Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Really looking forward to uh, another great conversation with Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. Elliot, we're going to start with you. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I want to talk about a concept that is called aggregation of marginal gains. And I'll tell you how I got to hear about this the first time. It was from a conversation with my friend Alix. And, you know, when he said it, when he put a phrase to something that I'd been, you know, once thinking about and pieced together kind of randomly, it was one of those light bulb moments. And I was like, wow, you know, there are a lot more of these out there than I've actually given credit to. And I should be thinking about it a little more. Um, so Alix had asked me, you know, what was it about Roku that really caught my eye? And I started listing all these little things from the simple user interface, the low price, um, the like openness and reliability that the content I want is there. And, you know, I had read a Tigas call from a former rep at Hisense. And I don't know if you, those of you listen to Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast at the very end of uh, them, there, there's some interview notes with me on Tigas. I, I mentioned this is my single favorite call that I've read on the platform. And, you know, it was uh, really interesting because the Hisense rep, rep was basically like, you know, these are all the things that Roku does behind the scenes for the TV OEMs. Um, they have strong relationships with the biggest retailers and help shelf placement. So they're doing that heavy lift and work for you. He listed specifically Best Buy, Walmart, and Costco. Um, they take 6% of the revenue for their licensing pool, but it goes towards a marketing fund. They put that all back towards selling the TVs themselves. So not only do they have boots on the ground with dozens of sales reps helping to make sure they get placements, they're also you know, actually putting budget behind selling TVs in their lineup. They had set very high standards for picture quality, which are much higher than any other tier two or three OEMs normally require. So there's known and trusted reliability when you get there. And then they also work with Hulu and Netflix and the important content companies to literally approve the chipsets that go into new TVs and then reach directly out to the semi-manufacturers and procure those chipsets once they're approved by these select partners, six months to a full year before other people can get access to them. And so, so, you know, especially in these times of supply bottlenecks, holy cow, is that something that's really important? So these are just the little things they do for the OEMs. And then you start adding in, you know, what they do for advertisers, the incrementality of reach, um, the analytics they give after the fact, um, the, uh, you know, data that they could add to get better targeting than you can in linear. And, you know, I'm telling you the specific things because when you ask, like, what does Roku do really well? There's not just one answer. It's a slew of these really small things that they do for each of their stakeholders uh, that are involved in the business. And when I started listing it out like this, Alix is like, oh, this is the most perfect example of aggregation of marginal games uh, that I've heard. And so, you know, I've gotten to thinking, like, what other companies are out there where you can't truthfully, you know, and I've talked about this before, I really like simplicity, I like distilling a thesis to one core essence. Um, and I view that as distinct from this question, where you can't truthfully say, you know, what the one thing the company does really well in one sentence is, where it's like these many little things that aggregate to something that's really big, really powerful, a little like Charlie Munger's Lollapalooza effect, where you have these like compounding forces at work and you have confluence and everything just comes together beautifully. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that I've started explicitly asking myself when I look at opportunities and perhaps especially ones where you could look at the results of the company in the marketplace. So I'm not talking about look at a stock price. I'm talking about look at how consumers react with a given product. And you can't put your finger on exactly why it is that the product has resonance to the extent that it does. 
Um, and, you know, maybe you piece it up, pick it apart and you start figuring out like, wow, yeah, there are a lot of these little things uh, that really make it stand out. And, you know, that makes it much harder. Well, one of the beauties of it is if you're a competitor, you know, how do you attack it? How do you pick which one of these little things they do extremely well with like much attention to detail um, and and make a better offering, right? So to make a better offering, you not only have to beat them in one domain with one stakeholder, you have to, you know, cover every one of these little bases, every one of one of these little boxes they check. So it's extremely resilient against competition in that sense. And it also makes it harder to explain. Like, you know, every one of us wants to understand a competitive advantage. Every one of us wants to understand why, you know, this little company can go up against the behemoths of Google and Amazon and compete them, compete against them when they're out-resourced. And obviously, one of the simplest exp explanations is that singular focus and essence really do matter. And I think really, truthfully, one of the ways it matters is the fact that you have boots on the ground and can take attention to detail in every single little area in a way that, you know, uh, one team within a very big company um, that's competing for resources within a company can't quite do. Um, so this is a topic I've been intrigued by. It's something that I think not, uh, it, it's much softer and less tangible than a lot of what investors tend to look for and talk about. But I think, you know, those types of situations tend to be powerful. Um, was curious what you guys think of the concept, how that resonates with you when you hear it. Uh, are there any obvious examples where you see a company who does something similar that's, you know, really hard to put your finger on the pulse, but when you break it down, there are lots of little things that are done with perfection and, you know, these marginal gains aggregate into something, something really powerful. So, uh, just to make sure I understand, would you say this is, I'm trying to find a, a way to distill it even more to make sure I understand it. Would you say this is sort of like the opposite of death by a thousand cuts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put okay. it. Okay, Good way to put it. All right. Good. So yeah, I, sadly, the first thing that I came up with was Costco. I think we've done enough uh, fanboying and, and drilling over Costco. So I don't, I, I, but I do think that's a pretty good example. And it ties pretty closely with the shared economy scale or shared economies of scale that are reinvested back into the customer, basically. Um, that, that seems to have a lot of overlap here. So those those types of things do go hand in hand here, right? I mean, I, I frankly think you, you mentioned Roku and I, you know, right down the road, so to speak, is Netflix. I think they've done a pretty good job at this too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think both those are really good examples. I'm not sure if they tie to the uh, scale economic shared, though it does seem like those companies that have those ethos that understand that they could create immense surplus and have a role in how it's allocated amongst their stakeholders, um, that those kinds of companies have, uh, I, I'd say, both more nexus to their stakeholders and more concern and care for certain ones. Yeah, it's it's correlation. I don't think one causes the other, but it does seem like there's an awful lot of overlap between the companies that can get this right. They're really going to aggregate lots of marginal gains for their customers' benefit and the types of companies that are going to take whatever scale they can gather and just sort of intentionally cap their own economics and reinvest it into, you know, better economics for their customers. It seems like they're going to be you know, the Venn diagram there's going to be Absolutely. pretty big. Absolutely. And you know, I've never really thought of Roku through this prism, but I mean it kind of is uh, that case in so far as they did it in reverse. That's that's the problem I have with it. Like the hardware is effectively at cost and the platform subsidizes the hardware. Um, but they use that. Um, and I think Compound on Twitter had mentioned this when, when we were talking about scale economic shared versus network effects. There was a great thread several, maybe it was a month and a half, two months ago. Um, and what what he said was one way to go about it is instead of using your scale after the fact, um, you share first to get to scale. And that's kind of what Roku right. did. So maybe maybe you are right. Maybe it is, as I'm thinking about this and taking a step back from my reflexive reaction, you know, it does feel like there, there could be some magic there. Yeah. I think the other example that jumps to mind is distributors. So I love a good distributor. And I think there are... A distributor done right is doing all the things you just mentioned, right? It's taking lots of little problems and solving them for their customers. And so it, it spans lots of different things, right? It entails 
the actual logistics operation. It entails customer service. It, it entails scale and purchasing power. It entails you know lots of little intangible things that they do right along the way. And when the inevitable problem crops up, how are they going to solve it? Right? I mean, I think that's such an underappreciated power in business is you can't plan for things to go perfectly. And when things don't go perfectly, are you going to have some like handcuffed, obnoxious, like r- run to the ma- user's manual, so to speak? Like, what do I do now? Or are you just going to empower your people to go out and make it right? And I think, you know, customer service of all varieties, like the, the companies that get that right, they let their people go out and use their best judgment to solve things. And so that I think can really be the icing on the cake for this kind of theory of aggregation of marginal gains where, you know, when when the gains are piling up, but like there's that risk of the last little thing spoiling it all, can you save it from disaster or are you going to just let it all wash away? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And it does like seem to create a sort of stickiness that w- with customers that other kinds of offerings where it's just singular and one point of contact and one thing that people associate them with to get right. You know, having all that, being there, being reliable, uh, you know, with distributors, I think that's a really interesting example because you have to have, you know, really uh, a ton of inventory. Um, and you need the scale to be able to turn it over enough. So it it is a scale game there too. Um, you know that makes a, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I feel like, you know, as investors, we struggle to put our uh, finger on exactly why they're used in certain cases and how they could. Uh, you know, I remember I think it was two years ago. Every distributor, everyone was fearing what what's Amazon going to do to them next. Um, right. And you wonder like. If you had approached it through this prism, uh, would I don't know? Would I mean maybe you were someone who was buying them hand over fist at the time? I gave a couple of look and was not, but maybe I should have thought about them differently at the time. Uh, no, behind I, aggregation, I should, have, I should have been smarter about it at the time for sure. But I did take a pretty skeptical view that you know just because Amazon's so amazing at a lot of things, they're not going to be amazing at everything, and you know they fail plenty of times and, you know, becoming in and being just a outsourced logistics operator never really seemed or a distributor never really seemed too, too likely to me. I don't know. But, you know, another, another example, I was just talking about this with somebody is like, I think we talked a little bit about the crossover between physical and, and e-commerce. So physical retail and, and e-commerce. And it, I thought of this because of Amazon, I was talking about this the other day with, you know, Home Depot has actually, in my opinion, been pretty forward thinking. Target has also been pretty forward thinking in terms of how they actually use their stores to complement the e-commerce business and vice versa, right? And that that to me is like an aggregation of marginal gains because, you know, there's some stuff where one works and the other one doesn't, but the two forces can combine to make for the best possible business for the customer. And I think both of those companies have done a pretty good job in that regard. Yeah, I think Home Depot is an especially interesting one. I don't know Target quite as well in that sense, but what I what I find interesting with Home Depot is they're also the kind where there's like multiple stakeholders on all sides. And you could think of like two distinct customer bases between the retail and the professional side and they've experimented interestingly on each and have like lots of little things that they just get right to keep kind of taking share from everyone else in the industry. And I'm not much I'm not much of a music guy, but, but um I think Spotify probably captures a lot of what you talked about, right? Totally, totally, um, in, and in fact, increasingly I mean, not, so. Yeah, exactly. I'm not much of an expert on the business model either. Like, I've tried to look at it, and I can't really. I have to start squinting pretty hard beyond like two or three years from now because it just seems like there's a lot more change yet to come in that industry, and I'm just probably not the one to figure out which way that's going to go. But if you look at how they've gotten to this point which is enormously impressive. It seems like it's an aggregation of marginal gains on like five or six different fronts for their customers. Yeah. And they're another one of those companies where there are multiple stakeholders and constituencies that they have to deliver value to in different ways. And I think one of the ones I'm most enamored with for Spotify going forward, and by the way, just a caveat, I have like this mental block about Spotify because I just uploaded so many damn fish concerts to uh, Google Play, and I, 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 you know, don't use the product, and I tend to not uh, 
grasp these things as well when I don't use the product. But I'm really enamored by the opportunity for Spotify to kind of add incremental value for artists and do more for artists and right. view them as uh, in a position to like do lots of little things on behalf of, of artists, whether it's raise awareness of their songs by including them in like algo derived playlist or um, finding people who listen to a lot of uh, one band's music and giving them a much uh, give, giving them more awareness about upcoming concerts and when and where they could go, you know, lots of little things, many, many little things. And yeah, I think, I think that's a great example. There's not any one thing they do. Right. And um, I guess, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of these platform companies that build their wedge in between multiple groups uh, kind of have that trait. Yeah, and one one other almost a counterexample that jumps out that seems like it would be a pretty obvious opportunity for somebody is in financial services and banking. And I know there've been a million fintech startups that are trying to, you know, do this or that better and instead most of the time we get either a business model that just doesn't really have any legs or you get some company that's just actively harmful like Robinhood in my opinion that doesn't improve the situation in a lot of always makes it worse. But if you were to have a financial services company that truly took this model to heart and said, we're going to take four, five, six, seven areas, whatever it is, like little little points of friction, little problems or little mileposts along the value chain and just try to take you know, 10, 20, 30% of whatever the problem is and make it better and aggregate those savings to the customer. It would seem like that would bring just enormous scale benefit to the customer and be a, a winning proposition. But there must Man, be Phil, you're making me something think harder. of this so much clearer because that company exists right under your nose and the language you're... Well, I was just going to say, yeah, there's got to be somebody out there and I'm just either not thinking of it or it's got to be way harder than I'm The language you're saying is exactly what Dan Schulman said on his uh, tour introducing like the newly yeah. spun PayPal to the world. And I'd been disappointed that they hadn't actually executed on the vision, but the way he phrased it is in financial services, everywhere you look, there are pretty high fees. And those fees are especially high for people who are underbanked and not in the financial system. And you could use the scale of technology to deliver better solutions at a lower cost and drive down those fees everywhere you look. Um, and then the company you built toward that so far, I think most effectively has been Square with the Cash App. And yeah. sure enough, that was a big wake up call to PayPal. And I think they've done a better job trying to like spread their tentacles and do a little more. Um, and then, you know, mentally, I wonder maybe, you know, it's a little too much like you got to draw a distinction between building a platform and driving your wedges like horizontally versus aggregation of marginal gains and where like, one should draw the appropriate distinction between the two. Just right. wondering out loud about yeah, that. Yeah, it's no, it's an interesting one with PayPal, I, and I I tend to agree with Square, and I think they they probably have. I don't want to put myself out as an expert on either one when I'm not. I mean, I've looked at both companies and know them somewhat, but I, I think they've probably tackled a, a little bit narrower band of what we were talking about, right? So that. I think the aggregation part is the key to this framework that you're talking about. And so I think PayPal and Square are both taking one narrow slice and and capturing the savings and passing it on there. I don't know that they're really aggregating like four or five or six different little marginal gains and, and piling them up. So again, like maybe at some point down the road, we'll all have PayPal, you know, savings, checking, you know, money transfer, credit cards, all that kind of stuff. And it'll truly be like an online home. It's I mean, all there, guess, man. You know, I, I know it's all there, but I, I certainly <laughs> don't use it that way. And I don't know how many people do. Do you, do you use it that way? Or I still have a, you know, Chase is my primary bank. And so they've done some of that, right? I mean, Chase has at least made some effort, uh, but I wouldn't hold them out as an exemplar in this regard to, you know, kind of aggregate marginal gains. But I think that that's at least, it's not too distant a thought for them. Yeah, I think Square's done it the most because especially with underbanks, they'll do everything from payroll at the companies they work to, you know, their account. They're, they're now a bank. So the account has all bank privileges. You can do direct deposit and, um, you know, all checking capabilities, uh, plus investing in stocks in addition to crypto. Um, and sending money, they have credit card, debit card, you know, the works, uh, just about everything. And I think it legitimately is being used that way. Um, PayPal to a lesser extent 
The only piece they're really lacking there is the uh, investing side, and they have crypto, but not equities. And you know, I I do think. I, I've been one of the things I've been saying to the company is like, give us some better examples of how like the top decile of most active uh, engaged users use the platform. Because I do think, you know, when you think about PayPal scale, it's pretty, pretty massive. I think there are a lot more people than you'd imagine who are using it in that way yeah, nowadays. Maybe. That's what I mean. Maybe I'm just out of touch with how people are using it. I mean, I think Schwab's done that a little bit over the years, right? I mean, they kind of inserted themselves as a low cost brokerage and then they've expanded out and, and tried to aggregate marginal gains for a lot of aspects of their customers' lives. So that's I guess I, I so I maybe was a little too harsh in saying there aren't many great financial examples, but it does seem like a ripe opportunity for them. Yeah, Schwab's a really interesting one too, because again, they're one of those that work across a slew of different stakeholders and constituencies too now. Yeah. And you look at what they're doing with the T D acquisition too, getting even farther Exactly. And people get all excited about the shiny new object and, you know, Robin Hood is, is the new Schwab or whatever. And it's like, well, that's a dumb thing to say for a whole <laughs> bunch of different reasons. But it, what, what strikes me about the, you know, the shiny new object syndrome is that, you know, Schwab was legitimately a technology company, right? I mean, that, that was kind of a differentiating point for them for a long, long time and still is. And so it's really a lot harder than I think most people think it is to come along and just disrupt somebody that's already made technology and change and adapting as a core part of what they do. So I, you know, and if the, if you marry it with a couple of other advantages, it gets really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And in each area, they do so many little things for each of the people that they take care of. And that's what really compounds, right? It's not like you use Schwab just because they're the lowest cost for trades. It's like, you know, lowest cost of trades. They have a robust platform behind them for the customer RIAs. services. The customer service is good. You, at least historically, it's been good or better than the alternatives. And the technology and the interface were relatively easy to use and didn't crash all the time when you needed it, like Robinhood. <laughs> That's actually a good point of contrast, right? So you contrast Schwab with something like Interactive Brokers. And Interactive Brokers, similarly, technology company, right? If you talk to people who work there, yeah. they'd say, first and foremost, they're a technology company. But what Interactive Brokers does is one thing really, really well. They do outstanding like execution and trading. I view that as one thing, not two separate things. Um, right. And if you look at everything else, not so well, right? They don't do good customer service. They don't have good uh, like reporting. They don't treat... I mean, if you're an RAA and use them, they don't treat your customer as their customer. It's like just the, just the RAA is their customer. All, all these things that you know Schwab does differently and approaches more holistically, where they want to get every little thing right, where they even have like basic software that you can use to manage your practice better. Um, I, I think that's a good point of contrast. So like the singular focus on where a technology company versus one uh, like Schwab, who's aggregating these marginal gains and does a lot of different little things, many, many little things that all you know add up quite beautifully. Yep, my grade. So yeah, this is this is the concept that I find uh, interesting. Curious, John, what, any of that stand out to you? Yeah, I love the concept. I, I'm I'm really trying to think about kind of how it manifests itself. I feel like every company that has a great product um, or service tends to think about the details and and kind of that in a way um, speaks to this concept. I think. Elliot, you'd probably agree. Naked wines with how with what they do with winemakers probably fits the bill. Totally. Um, yeah. Uh, another thought I had, maybe Disney also, one could say it uh, fits the bill just because of how they combine different assets so like movies, like the parks, uh, even licensing for toy makers, where basically they aggregate these these things to create a very, very powerful mindshare with consumers. Um, and yeah, I... I you know the question we've Phil we've talked about Peloton on here quite a bit uh, in the past, and I'm kind of wondering whether uh, that's what they're trying to do in terms of have with the product itself, plus then the instructors and the community and and so forth. I'm not a Peloton user, but I would think that you know they're kind of going in or trying to go in that direction as yeah, that's well. That's interesting. When I hadn't thought about that at all, I mean, I, the part of it that I found so interesting was that I, I used it for about two years. My office had it in the in the common gym area, and uh, it's a nice bike. The community part is, I think, where they were trying to differentiate, right? Because 
I, whereas marginal gains would be like, okay, this, this is actually a better bike at a cheaper price and you don't have to commute to a gym and it's right there in your home and you don't have to worry about COVID, all this stuff, right? Like those would be the aggregation of marginal gains. I don't think they focused on that at all from the company's perspective. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think they were just really more focused on this is a way to have, you know, this distributed network of people in a community. And that's what made them different and better. I could take either side of that. I could see myself going in either way because, you know, the bike, I mean, I've had a spin bike in the basement for years before I got the Peloton basically exactly one year ago. And it is a little better than other bikes that are out there. It's like smoother, sleeker looking, and um, definitely not cheaper though. Definitely not cheaper. Probably about, Mm -hmm. you know, two and a half X the price of, of something that would be comparable in quality. Um, the community angle is, you know, really big incorporating the, um, other activities, whether it be, you know, strength, yoga, uh, whatever, whatever it may be that other people use, uh, in addition. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does on the other hand, strike me as like, you know, it is about building the super app of fitness and that was their wedge. Um, so yeah, I wonder. Um, manual of ideas, John. I think that's one that really stands out in that sense. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Elliot. <laughs> I know, I know. It's been a while since I've given you this kind of shout out, but I had to. It's true. Well, on that note, I think we, can, <laughs> we, we, we we're ready to move on. Uh, uh, Phil, let's go. Uh, let's go to your topic. Great. Thanks. Um, I thought this week I'd talk about uh, an interesting paper that I read recently. Uh, it's by a guy named uh, Hendrik Bessenbinder, who's a professor at the Cary School at Arizona State. I won't read you his entire CV, but he's had a pretty interesting career in academia. And I think one of the things that I appreciate most in in reading his, some of his papers in the past couple of days is that although he can do good academic research, as he's incentivized to do, uh, he can also write clearly and he can write things that actually have practical implications, which I certainly appreciate coming from, from where he is. It's a, it's a rare gift. I can promise you that. So um, he's written a couple of papers that are really, really interesting. I'd encourage you to just Google all of his papers are up on his website. Um, There was a paper he wrote maybe four or five years ago about uh, whether stocks actually outperform T bills. And it ties into this paper. I'd encourage you to just go read that one directly. It's pretty interesting, but this one was actually, Uh, published last year in 2020. It was revised in November of last year. And it's titled Wealth Creation in in U.S. Public Stock Markets from 1926 to 2019. And the takeaways, I think, are pretty fascinating. And then I'll play a little guessing game at the end with you guys uh, with a a twist on it. So I think the part that's that's most interesting to me, and this ties into the the prior paper that I mentioned, is that there were 26,168 firms with publicly traded U.S. common stock in in the window, so they're using the the security price uh, CSRP CSPR, the Center for Security Price Research Database, and uh, so that's a pretty big sample set. And and shockingly enough, um, more than half, quite a bit more than half, fifty seven point eight percent of stocks actually led to a reduced rather than increased level of shareholder wealth. So he his methodology here is to take monthly data. So if a company goes public at the IPO price, that's that's the starting line. And then he counts just dividends and share repurchases, any, any special dividends, any spinoffs, any of that stuff is included. But any sort of direct distribution to the shareholder um, is a receipt of funds. And then at the end of whatever the period is, so if it's this was through the end of 2019, so if the company is still public, it would be its market price at that time. Or if the company had been acquired at a certain date, it was its price at that time. And it was, if a company went bankrupt, it was its price at the end of that month, et cetera. So hopefully you can see how this worked. And instead of trying to, you know, calibrate it to some sort of adjusted, you know, expected market return or something like that, he literally just compared them to rolling one month treasury bill returns and said, you know, would you be better off here? Did you did you increase your wealth relative to treasury bills or decrease your your wealth relative to treasury bills? And again, shockingly enough, fifty seven point eight percent of stocks led to reduced shareholder wealth. Um, 
but you know that doesn't mean that this was a disaster or a failure by any stretch of the imagination because between 1926 and 2019 the the aggregate increase in shareholder wealth was 47.4 trillion dollars so huge gains obviously we all know that the stock market's done well over time and that's true so even though the majority of individual investments were losers uh you know the aggregate number was still astounding and and interestingly enough the, the industry breakout was maybe not what you'd expect. And, and we'll go into that a little bit more. But particularly recently, things have been way more concentrated. So they, the, the best returns or the aggregate returns have always been concentrated, but they've been even more concentrated in the past three years. So he took a rolling three-year look at things. And this is, what, this is where I really got intrigued. So if you take rolling three-year periods, so the rolling three-year period ended in ending in 1929. You can imagine that was you know kind of a dicey period there, going right up to the abyss. And then the rolling three-year period in 1932, out of 776 firms, only 42 of them actually produced positive produced positive wealth creation in that three-year period. So the vast vast majority of stocks were losers in that three-year period. That's five percent of the total. And you didn't get down to a number anywhere close to that again until the bear market of the Nifty 50, 1972, 73, 74, were only 8%. So in that three-year period, 474 individual public stocks produced positive wealth uh, out of a sample size of 5,754. Pretty stunning. And then, you know, it's really been, by that, by those comparisons, it's been smooth sailing ever since. I mean, in, in 2001, which in, included at least I guess all of the the real bottoming out of the dot com bubble. I mean, it does include 1999 on the way up, but then 2000 and 2001 on the way down. The numbers fell way back down to earth, but it's still 39 percent, 39.9 percent of stocks had a positive wealth creation. Uh, in the financial crisis, was even a little bit better than that. So again, still more losers than winners, but 41.3 percent were positive. Um, and then, you know, we'll have to see this, this did not include the financial crisis or the, the pandemic crisis of 2020. Uh, but, you know, given what the financial markets did, you know, not going to be a big surprise when those numbers look just awesome. Um, so the other, you know, big takeaways here for me were just that, and we'll go into this, but you, you can't, you have to do one of two things, right? You either have to be really smart about doing something different than the index, right? So one of the ways I've always liked to do that is avoiding the bad ones. Um, you know, the index minus the nonsense stuff, the overvalued stuff, the meme stocks, whatever, right? That's not really good enough though, because, you know, just avoiding the bad ones is going to get you, you know, probably a less than 50% median kind of return. You really do have to have some of those big winners in there. And this gets right back into why the index is such a powerful benchmark. Because by definition, you will have those winners in there, and the right tail skewness is so powerful that it, it's hard to overcome that. Um, of course, valuation matters. Of course, capital structures matter. Of course, psychology matters. But you know, you, there's really no escaping that starting point. So, with that in mind, here are the all-time winners, and these are in 2019 dollars. Um, I believe they've been. I actually couldn't find exactly if or how he adjusted them, but um, I believe they're all just in nominal $2019. Um, so the number one company by a decent margin, do you any guesses? Elliot, you probably know this. I mean, it's hard considering this is like gross dollar value. It's it hard is. not yeah. to guess Apple. <laughs> That's, that is correct. Yep. Apple is the big is the big winner, followed pretty closely though by Microsoft. That was going to be my second. Right? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, so they both went public in the 80s, right? 1981 for Apple. So that was the inflow of, of, of capital. And then, you know, they, they haven't had massive capital returns since then. They've had a lot of share repurchases. Um, but, you know, it's not like they're the number three player on this company or three number three company on this list. We actually went public in 20 or in uh, July of 1926. So it's not I'm Amazon. <laughs> it is Amazon is a uh, number four, right behind okay, number three. Okay. Yeah. 1926. Geez. Well, it can't be GE. <laughs> Shockingly, GE is still in the top 15, even wow. after the disaster. So they went from number 
Well, a lot of dividends, a lot of spins, a lot of history. Exactly. Yeah. Let's see. He he did make a note on that because when he ran the rolling three year numbers, if he had done this three years prior, I'll have to find it. But GE did fall, right? So in the, the last three years, right, 2017, 18, 19 were not not <clears throat> not fun times for GE. So I think they went from like number five to number 12 or something on the list. They they took a pretty good fall, but they're still up there on the very, very positive side of the ledger. Got it. I don't even have a good guess for 1926 then. Yeah, Exxon Mobil is the uh, that makes you know, sense. They've existed the whole time. You know, they've benefited from, you know, production growth, lots of dividends along the way, obviously. Giant, giant company. And they were number one for the vast majority of the time, right? That this this study period would have covered. Uh it, it was really just until the last few years when Apple and Microsoft overtook it. And, you know, really wouldn't probably be a huge surprise to anybody. Amazon's within striking distance. So if we were to do this again on 2020 data or maybe 2021 data, it probably wouldn't be a huge surprise if Amazon overtook them. Alphabet's Oh, right it must be ahead too. of Exxon just by what it did in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and that's one thing he does point out, right, is it's actually pretty unusual. Obviously, these these data are all dependent on a snapshot in time. So you know, it's taking the market price as of December 31, 2019. So if one of these companies proves to be in, you know, a fraud or some disaster happens or whatever, like these data are going to look much different at a, at a future date, right? So this is not uh, definitive by any stretch of the imagination because as a current value that's market-based is by definition forward-looking, right? So it's not just counting up all the old dividends or anything like that. Um, Berkshire Hathaway actually checks in at number nine. So that's, you know, a pretty good showing there with over $510 billion of lifetime wealth creation. That's certainly higher again, given how they've done since the end of 2019. So, and they, so they probably would have overtaken, uh, their former investee who was right ahead of them. IBM was actually just ahead of them. I thought that was kind of interesting. So yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. If you look at the list of the top, you know, 25 or 50, it really is just a list of boring blue chips. I mean, again, you've got these quote unquote upstart technology companies like Apple and Microsoft at one and two, but they've been around for, you know, 30 or 40 years. They're not that new anymore. You do have, you know, Amazon's only 25 years old or whatever. And, you know, Alphabet's only been public for 17 years. So that's pretty, pretty new. But Johnson and Johnson's right behind Alphabet and they've been public since 1944. So not that new. And then you get down to, interestingly enough, the Altria Group, Tobacco, G- General Electric, and GM, and Chevron, and Coca-Cola, they all go back to the very beginning of the database. So that's actually, I should clarify, not the IPO date. It's just the beginning of the database in, in 1926. So they've been around forever, basically. And you know that's like half of the top 20 are these giant old dinosaurs, you know, Coke, Chevron, JP Morgan, General Motors, GE. Um, you know, it's it's pretty impressive that they've had that kind of run. But then being, you know, who I am, whatever's wrong with me, I, I couldn't help but look at the uh the list of losers. So if you if you go to the very bottom of the list, it's pretty stunning. Do you guys want to take any uh any guesses as to who's bringing up the rear here? There was one total shocker for me on this list. Oh man, it's gotta be a company that went public at a very high price. And That's- faltered from there yeah it's definitely part of it uh so i went back or to i like could the see top. like one of the banks who's massively diluted in recent years though they paid hefty dividends before yeah yeah i think that probably kept citigroup out of the that was who I was singling out, out there the, yep out of the dogs list although i'll give you i mean i'll give you partial credit for that so deutsche bank is actually like one two three four five six seven eighth worst so they're in the top 10 worst of all time. They've destroyed uh, over 54 billion between November of 01 and December of 2019. Wow. So that's that's pretty bad. Yeah, pretty bad. What um, about WorldCom? Yeah, there's some classic. John, that's amazing. That's the number one. That is the wow. worst wow. company of all time. You absolutely <laughs> nailed it. And they're, they're the worst by a good bit. So they're, they're credited or discrediting themselves with over a hundred billion dollars of lifetime wealth creation because they actually went, and this is what's so amazing, right? It does count secondary offerings, right? As you would hope, 
So they actually entered the database in December of 1980, which I presume was their IPO. And then before they went bust in July of 02, they managed to light $100 billion on fire, which is pretty incredible. Like they're, they're a f- about a f- sixth worse than the next closest companies, which are Lucent Technologies, Viavi Solutions. I don't, I'm not even familiar with that, that one. And then Wachovia. Oh, another Wachovia bank. is kind of a distant, distant fourth. Yeah, I should, you're right, Elliot. I apologize. I should have given you credit there. Wachovia. Uh, January of 73. I get no credit. The, uh, I was thinking Citigroup. So <laughs> saying banks wasn't good enough. Uh, no, Wach- Wachovia is a good, it didn't actually go bust. Wells it didn't now, right? quite dilute itself, but yeah, Wells. No, no, like that's uh, where Wachovia is? Or... Oh, yeah. yes. No, yeah, they they are in, Wells bought them. That is true. Yeah. Um, yeah, Wells would probably still be way, way on the positive side of the ledger, but I'm sure they've dropped. Yeah, Wells is actually still in the top 30. So they're, it, it, this is December of 19, which, you know, they haven't done too much, you know, actually better than Disney, believe it or not, Wells Fargo, you know, because they had such an unbelievable run for a long time there. And as bad as it's been recently, it hasn't been that bad. But uh, anyway, so checking in at number 10, which I thought was maybe the biggest shocker um, on the whole list was actually Kraft Heinz. And that's partly unfair because, you know, they didn't re-enter the database by going public after the merger until August of 2015. But it does show how important it is, right? When the starting price makes no sense in with hindsight, of course, right? And and obviously with some brilliant, wonderful people involved, um, you know, they've from from August of 2015 to December of 2019, $50 billion down the tubes. So that's a that's certainly a tough one. And then if you go just down the list from there, you get some unbelievable blast from the past, like uh, Global Crossing, uh, Level 3 Communications, Chesapeake Energy, actually in my prior life when I used to still short things, um, had a pretty significant short there for a while. And, you know, part of it was I looked and, you know, the company's been public since 1993 and they lit money on fire every single year, right? I mean, they were the only reason they continued to exist was they just continuously raised more debt and equity to grow production. And over the life of the company, and this actually, it, it would be worse because Chesapeake did file last year um, when oil and gas cratered in the pandemic. So this is only March of 93 through December of 19. So it got a little bit worse, but over that entire life period, um, a negative $17 billion uh, is pretty astounding. Uh, and for all the, the Hertz bulls out there, again, this is pre-pandemic, the Avis budget, uh, the, their car, rent, car rental competitor, October of 1983 through December of 19, a negative $15 billion. Uh, so that's a long run. That's pretty astounding. You go a little bit further up the list. Lehman Brothers does make an appearance there, uh, $12 billion down the tubes when they filed from public in 87 to death in, in 2008. Uh, you get some old classics like Webvan and eToys. So uh, anyway, just hey, a, Phil, a fast I'm- and yeah. I'm just curious on WorldCom, how much did they actually destroy? Yeah, you 100 billion. Oh, 100 billion. 100, 100 billion, yeah. yeah. And, and, and what's the, the sum of all the companies on the list, roughly, if you... Yeah, 47.4 trillion. Wow, so, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. E- no, it not, is a lot. Not even yeah. the Fed could, uh, no. could fix that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's 40... 47.4 trillion to the positive. So that includes the good and the bad. If you want Oh, no, I meant just the bad. Just the bad. Oh, let me add it up. I didn't actually add that just up. Just roughly. Be, yeah. Like is it is um, it even 1 trillion? Yeah, I would think it's got to be because there are there are thousands and thousands of negative entries okay. here. Okay. But let's say the top um, 20 top something like that. Yeah, like the top 10 would be pushing half a trillion. Okay. So yeah, I would think you'd be to several, several trillion in the top fifty, and several more trillion in the top one hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, this is going to take me a minute to sum this up. But anyway, the the takeaways for me, you know, just more broadly, were that you know you just just like you can't afford to miss the big winners, you really can't afford to take one of these giant losers, right? I mean, it's just brutal when you get stuck in one of these things. It's really hard to dig yourself out of that hole. 
So. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a couple interesting things I think about immediately. Um, it's really hard to have a high batting average with these base rates, right? <laughs> so obviously you yep. want to try to avoid losers, but it's really hard to have a high batting average. The, the kind of tide is against you. The other is like, you know, the, the magnitude of returns from the winners, like the asymmetry exactly. um, is, is massive. And it makes me recall, you know, I was sent one of these compendiums of uh, Murray Stahl's writing um, a while back. And I can't remember exactly which one I read, but I think it was somewhere in like the early 2000, maybe it was the late nineties. He did this exercise of going like 20 years prior and scraping through newspapers for companies that like at the time, the press was like, this company is obviously going bankrupt. Like no chance they're not going bankrupt. And um, looked at the, and I'm going to totally butcher the actual analogy, but there's a point at the end here, um, you know, said, what would have happened had you built a portfolio of just these 10 companies, right? And it was something like um, seven of them did go bankrupt, but the three who do not in aggregate had so much return that the portfolio in you know in a weak equal weighted portfolio of these 10 names significantly outperformed the S&P 500 over that time period. Yeah. And I'm I might be wrong about the exact numbers here but the outperformance was absolutely real. Um and you know I think that was that that left a really strong impression on me. Um you know obviously when when you talk about hitters uh no one even talks about batting average anymore but batting average versus slugging percentage is an important conversation. And it's something to think about from an investor perspective too, like having a sense of what you're looking for, what the base rates are in each case and you know how you how you are capable of making money. Um, it also, you know, I think impressed on me this idea that when you have a true winner, um, you know, what, what you were talking about, Phil, about these kind of increasing concentration in the biggest ones, and kind of like accelerating value creation from just a few firms. It, it, um, I don't know if it's something structural in our economy or not, but like the winners are winning more. And, you know, there are kind of like, like we talked about, like aggregating marginal gains, like there are compounding and accreting advantages to uh, the the companies who put themselves in position to win. And, you know, I think all of these things collectively have consequences for both you know, what pond do you want to fish in, right? So what kind of companies you want to be looking for and how you philosophically want to approach uh, um, the art of investing itself. I think that's really important. So it is super important. And it's one of the main thrusts of this paper. And just to back it up, so the, the data in the paper show that during the full 1926 to 2019 period, just five firms five total firms at the very top account for 12% of that total number. Not right. So out of the 26 and 26,000, 12% of the total is just five and then 83 firms. So 0.3, 30 basis points worth of firms account for half of the market wealth created, right? Like pretty astounding. And then to your point about, uh, about, it getting more uh, complicated or more concentrated at the top. Here's here's the number. Um, the degree to which the shareholder wealth creation in the public stock market is concentrated in a few firms has increased in recent years. So, for example, quoting the paper, the percent of firms that account for a quarter of the growth gross wealth creation, the average across all of the individual three-year periods is 0.45% of firms. And then up through 1995, it was actually a little bit higher than that, 0.5. But in the last three-year period, it fell to all the way down to 0.16. So if you wanted to look at it, you know, a little bit differently, it's it's three times more concentrated now than it's been over the prior periods in this in this paper. And so, you know, you've got again, like the the amount of of shareholder wealth creation just from Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple in the last three or four years kind of swamps everything else you could have ever imagined, right? It's just truly astounding. And one of the things that I find interesting about it all, like in past epics, when you've had such concentration of what you'd call market leadership, the companies at the top had some sort of like, I don't know, wonkiness and, and temporality to it all. Um, whether it be bubble or nifty 50 type behavior, um, God, 
famous last words, uh, this time feels a little different insofar as these are like truly great companies at reasonable valuations. Like none of the companies you mentioned uh, strike me as like, you know, maybe they might be a little overvalued right now. Uh, one of them in particular more than others, but like overall, they're not expensive when you think of where they are relative to the market on multiples or, you know, where they are relative to other like really good companies, no, I, especially. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you look at the list of losers. I mean, that's why I always like to turn it upside down and look at the losers and you look at the ones that just obviously produce disasters, right? I mean, Quest Communications is actually on there, negative 57 billion. They're in the top 10, but you know, there's no levered roll-up strategy at Amazon or or Apple. There's no there's no crazy capital structure. There's no, I don't think there's any real risk of it being a, a fraudulent scheme like WorldCom or something like that. So yeah, I agree. I mean, even if you go down the list of the more, you know, ephemeral things like Webvan or something, right? There's just that that is just not a valid comparison to what's happening today. So I'm totally with you. And then John, to answer your question, it is pretty interesting. So the net total, all of the aggregate lifetime wealth created 1926 to 2019, as I mentioned before, is 47.4 trillion. And looking at just the losers, the gross total of just the negative numbers, all the guys that did not produce uh, any wealth less than zero is is just 6.9. Trillion. So it, it really speaks again to what we were talking about earlier, which is the skewness to the good, the, the right hand tails being so fat, because even though there are more losers, more companies at or below zero, and they only total up to, you know, a little less than seven trillion. And all of the good, all of the winners, you know, outpace that, you know, handily, right? 47.4 trillion gross and, you know, 50, 54, 55 trillion. Uh, on their own. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. You can't lose more than a hundred percent, right? But you could certainly yep. make more than a hundred percent. I think there are two things yep. we should talk about that are somewhat related here um, that I think will accelerate the concentration of gains. First is this idea that, that you know, you might find yourself sitting here and saying, well, and, and they're both related. So I'll just spit them both out together. You might find yourself saying like, Hey, you know, I'll just hunt in small caps where these numbers won't even uh, meet uh, the threshold to to matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, the problem is uh, so many more companies are going public much, much later. And I think that has a higher likelihood of increasing the prevalence on the bottom of the list rather than the top. Like, for sure, you know, and Facebook IPOs as, you know, a, a, a pretty damn like huge company already, a lot of the gains that what you talked about in Microsoft and Apple, like a lot of those gains that happened in public markets, they're no longer happening out there in the public space. So that too kind of lends itself to um, uh, kind of concentration at the top, right? There's there's actually two really good examples of that on the list of losers. They're both in the top 50 or 60 losers. Um, and they, they've bounced a little bit, so it's not fair. They would probably be uh, higher up the list now. But Uber and Lyft were both you know, pretty prominent losers because they both went public in uh, 2019, June of 2019 and April of 2019, respectively. And because their, their prices finished that year so far underwater. I mean, the the mark to market was negative nineteen billion and negative ten billion, and so they've erased some of that. Um, but you know, it's it's I guess in Uber's case, they're they're over it now. But um, yeah, it, it points to the fact that you're right. If you come if you come to the public markets too late and your value and or your valuations inflated at the beginning, uh, it's really right. tough. You're going to have a problem. Right. No, that's interesting. I, I I didn't even think of those two as candidates for it. But holy cow! I mean. Like Uber's created a lot of value for a lot of investors, no matter which way you slice it. Uh, yet, for sure, you know, not so much for public investors, even though they've recovered considerably since then. Uh, and there isn't. An- yeah, and Lyft looks like Lyft has recovered. I mean, not the IPO price, but they've bounced a little bit from the end of 2019. Yeah, a little bit. But so. I mean, the other thing I would say is like, you know, in aggregate, um, there are going to be some investors who can capture way more of these returns turns uh than otherwise like people who are buying uber in the teens right 
you know, even even at a point yeah. where Uber was still a net destroyer of equity value, might have had meaningful contribution to the equity portfolios of others. So, not everything has to be painted, you know, in the in the same way. And it's kind of a skewed perspective, just looking at starting points. But holy cow, starting points matter a lot. Yep, for sure. I just um, I'm curious what you guys think. I mean, I struggle a little bit with how to apply this to our own investing, because it would seem like kind of goes hand in hand with the notion of letting your winners run and um, just kind of cutting losers. But, you know, just this example of Uber, if you had sold that when it was down a lot, um, you would have missed kind of the rebound. And conversely, you know, I think WorldCom was a really great performer for a while. And, um, and, you know, the people were saying this is the future you know they got the the network it's going to be huge so you know you could have bought into that um thinking okay well you know they're going to be one of the great uh value creators so i'm just kind of struggling with how to actually apply this um to our own investing because you can't just take your cues from the market price action it seems no i i agree 100 percent. so yeah i think what you pointed out is, is a good way to highlight both the opportunities and the potential pitfalls in an in a more actively managed portfolio right so if you just own the index you're going to get what happens here no matter what and it's going to be very low cost and it's going to be super diversified and so you'll capture that difference right between the the seven gross and the 54 or 55 gross, like you'll capture that 47 over time and you'll win and that's great. And that's the underlying beauty of indexing and passive investment for sure. On the active side, yeah, none of this captures any individual trading decisions, obviously, right? That's that's beyond the scope of what would be possible. But it definitely does highlight, yeah, you're right, John. I mean, you certainly can't look to what works today, you know, whatever's popular, whatever's uh, got a high valuation, you know, whatever looks really good is certainly not going to be the one that necessarily produces those gains, right, that you need to to capture over time. So I, from a practical perspective, like I said, I mean, I, my mantra has always been avoid the losers, avoid the nonsense. And that's true. That's still, of course, very valid, but it's also not quite good enough because you do need to capture the big winners too, if you're going to keep up. Yeah, I think those are really good takeaways. I was I was going to especially emphasize the second one. One that I'd add is, you know, um, and it's related to the first, be aware of base rates, right? We're swimming against the tide, just making a pick of any one stock. Um, and so understanding, you know, like, I often think with economics, you learn a lot more. With any economic question, you learn a lot more looking at where things go wrong than when, where, why, how things work. Uh, So trying to understand, I I would spend more time looking at the bottom of the list and trying to think about common threads. And I know it might be like backfitting patterns to something where it doesn't exist, but, you know, try to understand ways that you could avoid ending up and kind of improve the odds just from a dart throwing perspective that you'd hit uh, one of the winners. Yeah, I think you have to study the the winners and the losers, the first two pages and the last two pages. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, it as a as a concentrated portfolio investor, that is only going to go so far because like John said, there are going to be some opportunities where the company ends up in the middle, but if you can buy it at that, you know, one transition moment in its history where it's on sale for, you know, 75% off the normal price, so to speak, you're going to do great, even if the company itself in the database doesn't doesn't look quite as good. But yeah, look, I think the, the lessons of studying the last two pages of losers are timeless, right? Like bad accounting, bad capital structure, bad strategy, bad management, you know, running headfirst into a, a crisis of some variety, you know, lots of commodity businesses on here. I mean, they're, they're, those those lessons are timeless, right? And then, you know, at the other end, the lessons of the winners are are also timeless, but it can get trickier because you have that you know extra dimension of price to consider. Yeah, well, Apple's a really weird, interesting one, right? If you were to look at it, the first twenty years of its value versus the last twenty years of its value, I mean, it's the number one on the list. But basically, you know, I think it would have been the number one if you started in like nineteen ninety nine, right? Yeah, like I mean, all the equity value he doesn't is recent. 
Yeah, it is all recent for sure. It's certainly got a huge, you know, log scale type behavior going on there. So I, I, he doesn't provide the data. You'd have to go in and do it yourself in the database. Um, but you're right. I mean, look, Apple had some unbelievable disasters along the way, right? And before jobs came back, I mean, they were definitely at risk of a bankruptcy. And, and to John's point, if you had been able to buy it, you know, down there for for less than a dollar, some they certainly didn't come public at a dollar. So your returns, your wealth creation could have been multiples of this even, right? So it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty astounding. And but you're right. I mean, that's that's one of the things he definitely points out is that for the current winners, and this is an evergreen statement, it's going to be true almost by definition in every period. By but the current winners have created a massive amount of wealth in the recent past. And it's it's just a little more so right now than in any of the other 31 three-year periods covered by this by this study. Yeah. And then when you break that down to like actual returns and IRR, something like Exxon, I mean, to produce that much value over a hundred years doesn't mean <laughs> quite as much as producing that much value over like Google IPO in what, 2005, yeah. 2004? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it is it is impressive. You're right. I mean, I, I don't know. I wonder if Bloomberg could even do it if they could give me like a total return. Obviously, this database could, but um, what the total return would be? I mean, I I look at it more as just like you know, wow. If if the company's existed for that long and you've owned it, <laughs> you know, you've made so much money. Your tax basis is so low, like it's it's pretty ridiculous. You've done pretty well either way. But you're right. I mean, the IRR is not going to be anywhere close to something like, you know, it's only, it's done that in a shorter period of time. Maybe one factor that I kind of just thought of um, to identify the losers um, would be highly promotional management. So I think a lot of the losers had that. Uh, Certainly WorldCom did and a bunch of others on the list. And then conversely, the winners don't really have highly promotional management. I mean, you think of Apple today, it's not highly promotional. Um, Amazon's not highly promotional. So that that seems to be something that may have some signal value as a factor to consider. I, I totally agree. I mean, that, that plays right into my bias personally, just because I my skin crawls when, you know, some promotional manager comes along just trying to, to sell me a bill of goods. I think that's but I, I agree. Like if you look down this list, um, you know, they, they've had some characters along the way, right? I mean, in a lot of ways, Jack Welch was a was a pretty promotional guy, but um, you know, GE is has persisted through thick and thin. And you know, and there were certainly some visionaries along the way, but I don't see anybody Walt Disney was in some ways, I guess, a, a promotional type guy, but he wasn't, I don't think on the nefarious side of things like you're talking about. So I agree. That's a, that's a pretty good, pretty good filter. And Elliot, just to answer your question for, for one reason or another, Bloomberg will only go back to 1989, um, at least as far as I can tell for this purpose. But since uh, September of 1989 through today, uh, Exxon Mobil has compounded or, or the total shareholder return has been a little over 9% a year, whereas Apple and Microsoft are at 20% and 24% <laughs> respectively. So Different pretty, leads, pretty massive. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. Pretty massive difference there. But look, I mean, if you told me right now I could lock something up at 9%, you know, for the next 22 years, I'd do it in a heartbeat. 32 but years. But where were treasuries like, in 1989, in right? <laughs> Oh, for sure. They were way higher. But again, like I don't care where treasuries are going to be over the next 32 years. I'd probably But you're take a function of your year. environment. If you're sitting there in 1989 where treasuries have been in the double digits not that much earlier, you might be like, eh, yeah, 9%. No, what's they, that going to do for me? Yeah, they'd fallen by then. But you're right. You're right. There was a big difference. Yeah. But, but you know, that's why today, if if you have the same sort of you know, recency bias today with treasuries, yielding so little, you'd take even less than 9%, right? Without a doubt. I mean, that's that's where we are in certain markets right now, right? Yeah. And John, I would, I would add to your promotional point, they were promotional specific with their equity, knowing they had to sell a whole lot of it, right? right. So those companies yeah. were like serial diluters, constantly selling shares into the market to fund their objectives. And it wasn't like Disney, where it was like, they had to get one thing off the ground and then they're good and don't have to raise ever again. Um, a lot of those people, I think, 
tapped capital markets pretty regularly. Exactly. And so that, that was one of the biggest things I had with Chesapeake was, you know, the late CEO, Aubrey McClendon was one of the most gifted salespeople I've ever met. I mean, his promotional ability and his, you know, personality on the promotional scale was just off the charts, right? I mean, he would be right at home with all the promotional CEOs that we're talking about. And then you just look at the numbers and not only was the accounting kind of garbage, frankly, but the company was just one bad, you know, financing round away because they constantly needed to raise new financing, new debt and equity constantly had to be pumped into that company. Not every year, but certainly at very regular intervals, not more than a few years could go by without this company needing fresh financing or having to turn off the spigots. And I mean, what, what could be more clear than that? That's exactly right. Well, guys, on that note, uh, let's wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for another uh, great discussion. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening as well. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.